Welcome to Emmaus Road Church. I'm Craig, part of the leadership team here. I'm going to get us started with some gospel community updates. Uh, we are excited to announce uh, that Nick and Katie Arakaki, uh, for the birth of their daughter Hazel Howley Arakaki, was born April 10th at 3.40 a.m. Uh, we, we just want to invite you to uh, pray for them, and there is an opportunity to serve them uh, with a, a meal train that is set up. You can check that link out. You can check out ERC Town Square uh, Facebook group for that, the details on that meal train for them. Uh, so again, we rejoice in the Lord for, for the new birth of their daughter. I'm excited to, to meet Hazel in the days ahead. Um, we have numerous opportunities to serve at Emmaus Road. Uh, I'll work through um, those with you. There's uh, opportunity to serve in the nursery. Um, that is for members of Emmaus Road Church, who, ladies who are members. Um, so if so, that's something that you'd be interested in, you could see my wife uh, for that opportunity. There's opportunity in uh, the sound and audio visual to, uh, to serve with that ministry. Um, there's opportunity in the clean, with the cleaning up, cleanup crew, uh, opportunities with greeters and security. So if that's something, if any of those are areas that you think you'd be interested in serving the church, please uh, reach out to Micah at, at ercbozeman.com, and we will uh, give you the details on each one of those uh, areas of service for the church. Um, next up, we have uh, a summer study for the women that we're going to be announcing. That's going to be for all ladies uh, of the church. It's going to be a study going through Jen Wilkins' book, Women of the Word. Uh, it's going to be starting Wednesday, June 5th. Um, if you can let Tasha know if you are interested in joining that, uh, her number is on the screen there. It's going to be at Tasha Ord's home. Um, so yeah, just a, a great opportunity to get together to fellowship with women of the church and to work to just to to read the word and to study to learn to study the word. Uh, we we are just uh, that's foundational for us. Uh, so we encourage you to yeah to if that's something that works out in your schedule. I I, I would even say make that work out in your schedule. So yeah, just to again to to grow our foundation in the word of god um, next up we have uh, community groups just an announcement there we're going to be uh, gathering together with community groups through the spring and then uh, during the course of the summer we're going to be taking a break just to reset and reevaluate community groups so um, just know that that's going to be continuing on we'll have a, a solid date on when those carry through um, coming in the days and weeks ahead for you um, after the service, again, if we can make our way uh, in the to the foyer to fellowship, so we give the cleanup crew uh, the time they need to, to clean up this area that would serve uh, serve them well. So please, uh, we, we encourage you to fellowship and yeah, just move to the, to the foyer to do that after the service. Um, also immediately following the service, there's gonna be a, a meeting for the nursery workers in the nursery room. Um, and that is going to be Allison. My wife Allison will be uh, leading that for the gals. So if you can, whoever is serving in that ministry, please uh, make yourself available for that time. Um, so, and yeah, those of you who are serving in the nursery, thank you for doing that. Thank you for serving our families and, and the children of the church. Um, Micah, can you can come and continue to lead us? Well, good afternoon. good afternoon. Beautiful Sunday afternoon. It's tempting us, right? For summer is on its way. I hear it's supposed to snow this uh, later this week, so welcome to Montana. Uh, would you please stand for our call to worship? And I'd like to invite the worship team, the music team, up uh, to, to the stage with me. Last week, we considered God's trustworthiness, especially in the face of trials and challenges and the various circumstances we face in life. We saw that King Jehoshaphat faced the imminent invasion of a great foreign horde, and yet he turned not to military strength or the deliverance from earthly allies, but Jehoshaphat went to the temple and prayed to God. Yet, as Trey pointed out in last week's sermon, we have something far greater than the temple in Jesus. Listen to the words of the author of Hebrews this morning from Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. 
the writer writes, Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom he also created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. He upholds the universe by the word of his power. And after making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of majesty on high. Yes. This is the God, the King of kings that we come this morning yes. to worship and to serve. Yet as we gather this morning, we recognize that we are great sinners in need of a great Savior. The psalmist in Psalm 118 verses 8 and 9 writes, It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in man. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust princes. The Lord indeed is trustworthy. Yet we often find it challenging to fully entrust ourselves to him on a daily basis. Reflect on this past week. Where have you not trusted the Lord as you should? Have you turned to lesser things or sought comfort and strength from people or things rather than God? This morning, as we approach the Lord to receive the spiritual, spiritual nourishment through worship and the preaching of his word, let us bow our heads in prayer and in confession. Let us acknowledge our weakness and fragility before him, ask for his continual forgiveness, and receive from him grace and mercy through the finished work, of the, uh, work on the cross. Yes. So take a moment with me and bow your heads, if you will. And confess your sins and your struggles before the Lord now. Saints, lift your heads and hear the good news. The author to the letter of the Hebrews reminds us in Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 through 16. He writes, since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are and yet without sin. So let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace uh, to help in our time of need. God alone is trustworthy and, has, and this has been uh, pr uh, proven again and again, but it's been proven most clearly through Christ's work on the cross on our behalf. If you are in Christ, you are being continually reconciled to the living God. You have been reconciled, and he is continually reconciling us to the living God, yes. our great high priest. And so we can come this afternoon before him with thanksgiving and lift our voices in praise to the God who, who alone is worthy of all of our trust, yes. all of our adoration, and all of our praise. So let's lift our voices together and sing to the Lord who is worthy. The nations rage, kingdoms rise and fall. There's still one king reigning over all. So I will not fear, for this truth remains that my God is.
we have even more reason to trust in God than Jehoshaphat did because we have seen God in the flesh and he carried our burdens. He carried our sin with him to the cross. And then after that, the veil was torn in two and we may approach the Father in prayer. Next, we're going to sing, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing, recalling that it was Jesus who pursued us and that we will be with him.
Thank you, music team, for leading us in worship. We welcome our scripture readers forward now. May God continue to minister to us through his holy word. Our Old Testament reading is Psalm 56. Be gracious to me, O God, for man tramples on me. All day long, an attacker oppresses me. My enemies trample on me all day long. For man, many attack me proudly. When I am afraid, I put my trust in you. In God, whose word I praise. In God I trust, I shall not be afraid. What can flesh do to me? All day long, they injure my cause and their thoughts are against me for evil. They stir up strife, they lurk, they watch my steps, and they have waited for my life. For their crime, will they escape? In wrath, cast down the peoples, O God. You have kept count of my tossings, put my tears in your bottle. Are they not in your book? Then my enemies will turn back in the day when I call. This I know that God is for me. In God whose word I praise, in the Lord whose word I praise, in God I trust I shall not be afraid. What can man do to me? I must perform my vows to you, O God. I will render thank offerings to you. For you have delivered my soul from death, yes, my feet from falling, that I may walk before God in the light of life. This is the word of the Lord. Our New Testament reading comes from Romans 8, 31 through 39. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, How will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised? Who is at the right hand of God? Who indeed is interceding for us? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulations or distress or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword. As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, 
nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is the word of God. Thank you, scripture readers. <clears throat> I'd like to uh, dismiss children ages zero to four. If you would like to take your kids to the nursery, if that would serve you. Uh, we have wonderful nursery workers who would love to care for your children. Uh, <clears throat> during our service, they will bring them back just before communion. Also, can I uh, have the ushers come forward with the plates for tithes and offerings? Just want to thank you again uh, for all of you who give continually and faithfully to the ministry of Emmaus Road Church. Uh, allow us to continue to, to serve and to meet together um, <clears throat> as a body. So again, thank you. Also, as a reminder, you can give online if that uh, suits, your, uh, suits you better. You're welcome to do that on our website. So ushers, if you want to go ahead and pass the plates. For our pastoral prayer this week, again, we're praying for three things. First, based on last week's sermon, Trey's sermon last week, we're praying uh, that God uh, would bring uh, that, uh, okay, let me start over. Praying that as life brings unexpected news and news, unexpected news brings fear, that we would go to the Lord first in prayer. And that in faith, we would cast ourselves upon his mercy and his sovereign grace for us, knowing that indeed he does care for us. And that, again, has been proven without a doubt, with certainty on the cross and proven through the resurrection. So we're going to be praying for that as a, uh, for us as a church. Local ministry, we're going to be praying for pastors in the Gallatin Valley, that God would raise up God-fearing, humbly bold men to proclaim faithfully the word of God with truth and with power. And then we're going to be praying for our body, for children, for babies, for kids. Uh, we're going to be praying for health. There's been a lot of sickness that's been going around. We're going to pray for continued health. Uh, and then this isn't technically praying for uh, babies, but for parents, uh, strength, endurance, perseverance. Uh, nights can get long for sure. And then uh, we're also going to be praying that as a community, we would take it on ourselves to invest in the kids of Emmaus Road Church to raise up young men and women in the faith. So if you will, bow your heads with me as we turn to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for your word that is preached. We thank you for your word because it is true. We thank you for your word because it tells us that we have a hope in you and that hope is certain. Lord, that you alone are trustworthy. All else may fail, but Lord, you alone are trustworthy. So Lord, help us to be a people that as unexpected news comes our way, and it will, you have promised that, as it does, Lord, that, Father, we would turn to you. We would cast ourselves upon you. Look, we would find our hope, our, our security in you alone. Lord, it is tempting uh, to be people who, who seek to solve our own problems, to pull ourselves up by our, uh, our bootstraps, Lord. And yet we are a people who have been redeemed, not because of what we have done, not because of our grit, our tenacity, our hard work, but because of your mercy and your grace and your intentionality that you have steadfastly pursued us to redeem us. And so, Lord, our hope is in you. So help us, Lord, to be a people that grow in our hope and our steadfast trust in you. Help us to cast ourselves upon you in the, in the small things, the everyday things, Lord, that you would bring to mind continually throughout the day, moment by moment, even in the mundaneness of life, our need for you, your presence. And then, Lord, that in the small things, we might commit ourselves again and again, simply asking, Lord, what does it mean right now to know you, to trust you, and to fall more desperately in love with you right now, this opportunity? So, Lord, would you help us to be a people that are aware of you, consciously aware of you, and entrusting our lives to you daily? 
so that when the big things come, Lord, it is, it is our first impulse, it is our first move, it's our instinctual reaction to hardship, to difficulties. And Lord, that we might be a people that draw near to you and proclaim your name because we know you. We have been with Jesus. And so, Lord, may you be exalted through this. Father, we pray for the pastors in this valley. We pray for other churches that have met this morning, churches that are still going to meet this afternoon and evening. God, we are not the only church in the Gallatin Valley, and we praise you for that. God, we thank you for men that you have raised up, equipped to preach your word. And Lord, we pray even now that you would be preparing men all over the world to come to preach the gospel with power and in truth in the Gallatin Valley, that your name might be lifted up, that your church may be strengthened, encouraged, and commissioned to do the work that you have called us to do, that you have enabled and equipped us to do, Lord, that we might be a people that are well-fed on your word because of faithful men that you raise up and equip. So, Lord, we, we just pray for the ministry of your word in the Gallatin Valley, that it would grow continually. It would grow in breadth and in depth. And, Lord, that it would impact uh, a people that are far from you and strengthen those who are near you. Yeah. Father, finally, we, we thank you. We thank you for the gift of life that we get to experience. Um, we get to participate in the bringing about of new life through marriage and through the kids that you have uh, allowed, blessed us with. And so, Lord, I pray for health for these young kids. Lord, would you protect them? Would you guard them? Would you strengthen parents as they seek to disciple even infants and young kids? Uh, Lord, would you grant parents wisdom to care for, to guide, to direct, to correct, to build up, to nourish, and to pour out love on these kids? And that as these parents do that, it would be a reflection of your love for for these kids and for us, that through the parents they would get just glimpses of you, and Lord, that would compel them to draw near to you, both now and as they grow older and as they have kids of their own. Would you help us to be a community that disciples our kids well, Lord, that invests, that evangelizes our kids, that proclaims the gospel, both in word, in deed, in, in attitude, in all that we do, that, Lord, we would be a people that have drawn near to you and we exude the gospel. So, Lord, would you do this in us because we need you to, by your spirit, through your word, would you make us a people that hunger and thirst for you and, Lord, that receive from you what only you can give and, Lord, that we would minister that well to our kids, to our neighborhoods, to our coworkers and beyond. God, we thank you that it is your work and that we get to participate in your work. And so, Lord, we commit these things to you um, because you are trustworthy, you are able, and, Lord, you are good. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. The word of God is good, it is powerful, and thank God it's true. We're not here in vain, we're not here by mistake, we're not here with empty hope, but we're here to hear the word of God. God has spoken to us through his word, through his son most clearly, the word incarnate. But he's also given and given to us his inscripturated word. And through his people, by his spirit, his word can be proclaimed to the hearts of men and women, and it can change us, transform us for eternity. Amen. And so that's why we gather here as a body, as the body of Christ today, to hear, to receive the word of God. May God bless the preaching of his holy word today. This morning we are privileged to have Lynn Baird with us. Lynn is a retired pastor who serves in Sovereign Grace Church as he has served in uh, Arizona and California. 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 That's weird. California. Um, <clears throat> that's not even a right pronunciation. That stayed on the West Coast. Um, <clears throat> Pasadena, is that where? Okay, Pasadena. For the last 45 years, Lynn comes to us from the Sovereign Grace Sister Church in Arizona, where he and Trey uh, both attend and definitely serve uh, Sinner Church. Uh, we're thankful to have Lynn out here to serve us, to support us, to encourage us. 
uh, and to mentor us as a young Sovereign Grace Church. So I'm going to invite Lynn up. I'm going to pray for him. He's going to be preaching the word to us this morning. So <clears throat> prepare your hearts to receive. Father, we just thank you that you have equipped men and that you have brought men here even with us. Lord, we thank you for Lynn. We thank you for the ministry that you have given him and you continue to give him. Lord, I pray that this morning as he opens your word, God, that by your spirit you would strengthen, encourage, and empower him to preach your word clearly. Lord, that your word would have its effect in our hearts. And Lord, that those effects would impact our week uh, as we go forth into the world, uh, into our neighborhoods, into our homes. And Lord, that um, as we do, we would live from your word and for your word and to your word, Lord, as you work in us. So we just ask that, uh, Lord, you would, you would bless Lynn and, uh, Lord, that you would open the ears and the eyes of our heart that we might hear. In Jesus' name and for your glory, Lord Jesus, amen. Amen. All right. Well, what a joy to be with you here today. Uh, I have been asked why, why we came and I want you to know that it has nothing to do with fly fishing, even though Trey and I both are fly fishermen. So, but I know, I understand that you understand fishermen, so you're prone to think I'm lying. But anyway, we're here because we love you guys. We are grateful to be here uh, uh, and serve you in any way we can. Want to know, want you to know we've had a real, it's been a real privilege to be with Micah and uh, Craig in particular, we've spent time with them uh, as they have been tasked by Sovereign Grace leaders, oops, been tasked by Sovereign Grace leaders to lead this church during a time where it's been, to say the least, it's been a challenging season. And God has been asked, they have been asked by Sovereign Grace to lead in this way. And so I'm grateful that God would appoint leaders like that and I just want to say to them and uh, to their wives, uh, Krista and Allison, how much I'm grateful for them, how much we're grateful for the work that God's doing in their lives and in you as a church. And during this time, as you're focused on the, the God's work and what he's doing in your lives and what he's doing in the lives of, of your children and for the future of this church, just want to thank them for for laying down their lives and, and being willing to lead during this time. I'm going to be preaching today out of 1 Corinthians 3, so you can turn there. 1 Corinthians 3, verses 10 and 11. This message is one that I have been uh, praying about, uh, actually developing over the course of uh, some time here. We just, just had a burden on my heart, and when it came time to be here, and was asked to speak, it was this message that I felt like the Lord put on my heart to do here. So uh, let's turn to 1 Corinthians 3, 10 and 11. And we'll read this together. According to the grace of God given to me, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation and someone else is building upon it. Let each one take care or be careful how he builds on it. For no one can lay a foundation other than that which has been laid, which is Christ Jesus. Pray with me. Lord, we've come to you already to pray, to seek your face. We do so again because we want your word to impact our lives and our hearts. We want you to bring change to us. We're, we don't want to be passive listeners who just hear something and it goes in and out and has no effect. We want your word to change us. So come today. Speak to us. Lord, help me in my, my limitations to speak clearly and helpfully. Lord, help us, our ears today, to be uh, to be opened, our eyes to be illuminated to the truth of your word, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 
in a sentence, this is what I want to say today. Christ is our foundation and the focus of how we build. Very simple. You would have come up with that by just reading these passages yourself. Christ is the foundation. No other foundation can be laid. And we need to be careful how we build on that. We're all building something, right? You're all in the process of building something with your spiritual life. You know, we're, it's every action, thought, day by day, building something. The question is what? What are you building? What is the foundation that you're building on? And how are you building on it? Well, I just want to give two simple points that are, again, obvious from this passage. First of all, the foundation, the gospel, is key. And secondly, everything we build must be focused on the gospel. It's said that the legendary football coach, Vince Lombardi, after whom the Super Bowl trophy is named, would go into camp every year. Now, this may be apocryphal, but I'm going to use it anyway because it's great. He would come into camp every year, and he would lift up, the, bring his all these professional players around him who have been playing for years. He would hold up a football, and he would say, this is a football. And, of course, the point was, and they knew their coach, the point was, we're going to start training camp by focusing on the basics, focusing on the foundations, making sure that what we're doing, we're doing on a good foundation of what it means to play football. Well, that's what we need to do as a church on a consistent basis. We need to be going back to fundamentals at times and look at those basics again and make sure the way we're building is the way God intended it to be built. I uh, recently bought a boat. Well, recently, last summer, I bought a boat. So I retired, and so I thought this would be a great idea, right? Buy a boat. I love to fish. Trey and I fish every week together. So I thought we, we had bought kayaks and would go out on kayaks, but it became very apparent that kayaks weren't going to last very long for a couple of old men. So boat made sense, right? Get this. So I bought this bass boat that has the, the seats on both ends where you can just sit there and relax and cast. Oh, baby, it was great, you know, I thought. So we take the boat out the first time, and we get out, on, out to the lake, and we launch the boat, and we get out on the lake, and we're fishing for a while, and then we go to come back, and the boat won't start. So we're stuck out on the lake. Well, we finally figured out that it was a corroded cable, so we fixed that. But on the way back in, we noticed that the boat's not running right. It's running funny. So I'm getting more discouraged, like, okay, what the heck's going on here? We, well, why can't you just buy an old used boat and it'd be okay, right? <laughs> Well, it wasn't we're turning out that way, so we're, we're headed back into the dock, and I'm a, being as experienced with the boat as the last hour would have made me, I run into the dock, and I ruin my trolling motor. So, I mean, this is all going great, right? So now the trolling motor's ruined, so now I go to start the boat so we can load it onto the, the trailer, and the boat won't start again. So we have to put it on the trailer by hand. In the process, I fall in the lake. One of those classic fail moments, you know, where you're hoping nobody has a camera and they're filming you. So, and it ended up somewhere on the internet, who knows where. <laughs> so, at this point, I take the boat back into the shop. We have it worked on, get it fixed, and it's running great. And then I go back out to the lake and we're going to go for it again. Get all the way in, get the boat launched out into the water, and the boat won't start. But this time, the boat won't start because I didn't bring the key. <laughs> All of that, and I didn't even remember to bring the key. The boat won't start because I don't have a key. It won't operate properly without a key. It might look like a boat. It might have all the parts of a boat. It has the potential of a boat. But without the key, it won't function like a boat. Why am I saying all that? Because basically, when we look at this passage, the gospel is the key. The gospel is the foundation. Without the reality of the gospel, Christianity does not work. The gospel left out or forgotten or unutilized or marginalized, it won't function. Not it won't function right. It just won't function.
function. There's no key. It's a non-starter. That's what this passage is telling us. We have this foundation, and if you build on the foundation, you're going to find success. But if you try to build and you're not clearly planted on that foundation, it's not going to be what you hoped it would be. Paul says no one can lay a foundation other than that which has been laid. In Romans 15, 20, Paul says, and thus I make it my ambition to preach, listen to this, preach the gospel. Not where Christ has already been named, lest I should build on someone else's foundation. So Paul is saying the gospel is the foundation. The finished work of Christ is the foundation. Now this foundation has been attacked from the beginning. Paul was dealing with attacks here. Uh, he was dealing in Galatians with the Judaizers who were attacking, undermining the gospel. You can go back in history and see in the early church history the Arian uh, heresy that was undermining the gospel. You see that Luther in the Reformation, what's the whole point? The gospel has been undermined. And so he's bringing truth that's going to restore the gospel. Even in our day, Jehovah's Witnesses, Mormons, have differing views of the nature of Christ. All of this undermines the gospel. And so we want to look at this passage, revisit it, and secure in our minds and our hearts this foundation, number one, the foundation, which is the gospel. So that's point number one. The context here, as we talk about this foundation, the context, Paul's discussing him and Apollos. So that's the context. It's him and Apollos, and they're talking about building on a foundation, being on the right foundation, being very careful how you build on that foundation. But Paul's point is about how him and Apollos, how they are not, he says, anything, but the foundation is everything. We do not build on men. We build on a foundation of the gospel. Paul says he's talking about the finished work of Christ. You cannot have Christ without the cross. That's why Paul said in 1 Corinthians 1.23, we preach Christ and him crucified. I'm not telling you anything new. I know you've heard all this before. Christ and him crucified. In chapter 2, verse 2, he says, I decided to know nothing among you except Christ and him crucified. I looked up that word in the Greek, nothing. You know what it means? Nothing. <laughs> there is nothing that I will preach outside of Christ and him crucified. In this context, it's going to be all about Jesus. He is the foundation, and you might as well get used to my preaching. That's what it's going to be about. And so we see uh, Paul here is making sure that we understand that it's Christ crucified. Without the cross, nothing in the Bible makes any sense. Without the cross, nothing in the Bible makes any sense. You go, go back and just do, just do a quick history of the Bible. The fall. You see, man's inability from the very beginning to live life that glorifies God. Literally, sin enters and destroys what God has made. You see, under Noah, you see that God uh, destroys the entire world because it's so wicked. And so he wipes out Everything You see under Joseph, you see his brothers are so wicked that they're willing to kill him. But they end up selling him into Egypt. And then we see the people of God in Egypt. And in Egypt, they, they're, they're, they're aware of all that God is doing to deliver them. They're seeing God do miracles and powerful things among them. And yet, they are complaining and whining all the way on the journey as God has delivered them. They're seeing what God has done, and they're not connecting the dots that this is what God will do for them if they just trust him like we've talked about and Trey talked about last week. And then we go further to see that God brings the law, and the law is there to reveal his holy nature and taught them how to serve and honor him. And they're standing there at the base of the mountain, and there is smoke, and there is fire, and there is thunder, and this thing is crazy. Everything's going berserk on the mountain, and you'd think, okay, this is God. They had even said, please don't, don't let us talk to God. You talk to him for us. And yet before Moses even gets down the mountain, 
They have made a golden calf. They are worshiping another god. How, what an obvious reality that man can't in his own nature, in his own self, serve God. You see the judges, the time of the judges come and they continually reject God's law and God's plans and God's ways and God brings judgment on them. And he delivered them time and again. Then they finally asked for a king. And they get a king. But the kings lead them astray. Some of the kings do okay. But by and large, they're led astray into greater and greater sin. And that sin continues to the day as the prophets come and tell them not to go that direction. Get back to the Lord. The prophets are calling them back. The people refuse. And ultimately, God completely wipes out. He does to the Israelites, what he did to the nations. Wipes them out, removes them, takes them completely out of the promised land. Time and again, God showed himself strong. Time and again, they left him to worship something else. Time and again, they failed to see God's holiness, to keep the law, turning to serve their own selfish desires. The Old Testament proves this. You can't serve God in your own power. You can't do it. You will not do it. You might think, well, come on. If I was in Egypt, I'd be different. And you'd be fooling yourself. We need to realize this is what the Old Testament says about mankind and it says about us. We are hopelessly trapped in sin. And God brought se brings severe judgment. Besides all this, you see God demanding the destruction of whole civilizations in the Old Testament. You ever notice that? Well, I'm sure you have because you probably said when you're reading the Old Testament, how could God demand that they kill, wipe out whole civilizations and, and be willing to say that you kill women, children, dogs, cats, animals, burrows, whatever you got out there, wipe it all out. What's with that? What kind of a God would do that. There are so many illustrations of judgment in the Old Testament that just seem unjust by our standards. But all of them pale in comparison to God's justice exacted on the cross. You will never understand the Old Testament unless the cross is front and center in your thinking and in your mind. The cross is the focal point of history. Everything in the Old Testament points to the cross from the very beginning where the, off, the, the Satan will bruise the offspring's heel, but the offspring of, of Eve will destroy him. Prophesying Abraham. We see in Abraham, he's told to take his son up to Mount Moriah and on Mount Moriah sacrifice his own son. Sounds brutal, sounds terrible. You can't figure it out. What's going on with this picture? And yet God provides a sacrifice there on Mount Moriah. And then we see sometime later, God incites David to do a census. This is one of those fun things I love about scripture. God says to David, do a census of the people. And then he comes back and says, that census was sinful. I'm now going to judge the people. It's like, what? What is with that? What? What's going on here? And God begins to judge the people, and the angel is destroying people. And he comes to a place called uh, the, the, uh, the wheat, we call it the thing that uh, they winnow the wheat. Aruna, the Jebusite, owns this. And David comes up to this thing, and he sees the angel, and the angel is stopped right there. And so then David buys that, that, that wine, that what threshing, floor. threshing floor. That's it. Thank you. He buys this threshing floor, and... And then he sacrifices, and it stops, and it brings an end to the judgment of God. This threshing floor is on Mount Moriah. Mount Moriah. And David purchases it. And this is the same mount where Solomon builds the temple. And then... Hundreds and hundreds of years later, Christ is sacrificed on Mount Moriah. The very land David purchased 
To stop the judgment is the place where the Christ, the son of David, is crucified. He's sacrificed to end all sacrifices. The once for all sacrifices. We wonder about God being unjust. Well, you need to just look no further than this. You think, is that unjust? And yet what we understand, we understand what God is doing here. It seems unjust or over the top, but what's going on here is it's Christ being subjected to the most cruel, vile death a person could die. The Holy Son of God subjected to the most humiliating, unjust trial and sentence. So unfair that even Pilate doesn't want to pronounce this sentence. This is the key. This is the foundation of all God is doing. The sin of the world at this moment is placed on Christ. He became sin for us who knew no sin. He takes it all. He bears our sin on the cross in order to pay the ultimate cost for sin, the sacrifice of his own life. God's wrath against sin, seen throughout the Old Testament constantly, is suddenly seen in the most profound and amazing way as God crucifies his own son. What does Isaiah say? Smitten by God. It's so easy to pass over that. And, and not realize and not think clearly. God crucified his own son in our behalf. Only in the light of the cross will you understand the darkness of the Old Testament. Listen, cross is not plan B. Okay, it's easy to, to think, well, maybe God came and tried to do it through the law. And ah, bah, the law didn't work, so let's try something else. Okay, let's have my son come. No, that's, that's plan A. This is God's plan from the beginning. God knows the nature of man. God knows what has happened in the fall. This is the only way that's going to make any dent. This is the only thing that's going to work in reconciling man to God. There's no hope of this coming through the law. Last year, we we celebrated our 50th anniversary, and Terry and I went to the um, jewelers because I wanted to get a ring. It's a long story. I won't go into it now, but uh, I wanted to get a new diamond for her. And so... We're looking at these diamonds, and you would be aware of this. You've heard probably this used as an illustration before. But the jeweler brought out this black velvet cloth and lays it out, and I smooths it out, then takes out the diamonds with tweezers one at a time and just sets them up there. And you just look, and on that black velvet cloth, these diamonds just sparkle. It's like, whoa, this is, this is so cool. It's beautiful. Well, that's what the Old Testament is. The Old Testament is that black cloth that's laid out, and you look at it and think it couldn't get any blacker, it couldn't get any darker. And then God comes, and he puts the beautiful diamond of the cross on top of this so that we can look at it and say, what an awesome God, what a powerful thing that God has done. It serves, what did that cloth do? It served to make the diamond look more beautiful than ever. What does the Old Testament do? It serves to make the cross look more powerful, more beautiful than ever. The foundation of the believer's life is what the enemy's going to attack. If he can get you distracted from the gospel, looking a different way, getting focused on other things, deeper things of the Lord, there's nothing wrong with good biblical teaching, but it's so easy to go to deeper things and forget the reality of the cross behind it all. If he can take the key, he can keep your Christianity from functioning. He doesn't care. Satan does not care if you're a good person. In fact, if he had it his way, you'd be a wonderful person without any problems in the world because that's the best way to distract you from the truth, making us think that we're something in and of ourselves. When in reality, our only hope is the cross of Jesus Christ. One theologian put it this way. We never move on from the gospel only to a deeper understanding of it. Mark Prater, the president of Sovereign Grace, said this. I resolve to keep the gospel central in my life, affections, marriage, home, and ministry, 
for it is the grand storyline of the Bible, the pinnacle of God's redemptive acts, the power of God, and the essential message for faith, life, and witness. C.J. Mahaney, our founder of Sovereign Grace, many years ago did a message called Keep the Main Thing the Main Thing, all about the gospel of Jesus Christ. He has served us well. That's what we've attempted to do. Understand and keep the gospel central to our lives. So the gospel must not be just the foundation, but it must be what we build upon. And this passage says we must be careful how we build. So we want to build, not point number two, everything we build must be built on the gospel. I want to reference a man that I highly esteem, a guy named Mike Bullmore, who did a message at Sovereign Grace hmm, decades ago, and I remember the message. I went back to try to find it, and I couldn't <laughs> find it in our archives, but he did a message called the, the Functional Centrality of the Gospel, and he used this, uh, this illustration of concentric circles. So you know what that means, right? There's thing, the target, the bullseye, whatever you want to call it, in the middle. Then you've got a concentric circle around that. Then you've got another concentric circle around that, and then another one uh, around that. And he used this to illustrate keeping, having the, the gospel be functionally central to our lives. So I'm going to borrow that illustration and cover this with you. So the inner point, or the bullseye, is the gospel. It's the finished work of Christ, as we've always said, the foundation, the hub from which all the spokes go out. There is no other foundation. Paul stated it once again clearly in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 3. Now I remind you, brothers, of the gospel that I preached to you, for I delivered it as a first importance. What I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures and that he was buried and he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. This is the fundamental truth that drives everything. For 2 Corinthians 5.21, the gospel. He became sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be called the righteousness of God in Christ. He takes our sin. He gives us righteousness. This is one author calls this the great exchange. There's now, therefore... No condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Well, there's again one of those scriptures. You can go over that so quickly and so easily but without realizing there is no condemnation. And yet probably, I'm guessing, on an almost daily basis, you probably experience condemnation. Right? Something happens. Something goes wrong. You mutter a curse under your breath. You do this or that or something happens and you, you sin in some way, and immediately you feel condemnation. You feel like, oh, man, I can't believe it. And then there's those ones that you did again, you know, for the umpteenth millionth time, and you're thinking, oh, man. And, but the Bible says if you're building on this foundation, there is no condemnation. It's a free gift by God's grace. It doesn't emanate from us. Its roots are in the character of God. He chose to do it before the beginning of time. This is the inner ring. Now, the second ring that goes around that. That ring, we'll call that gospel truth. So around, cycling around that inner bullseye is this ring of gospel truth. It's truth that emanates out of the gospel. It's not the gospel directly, but it is coming from the gospel. It's the stuff we're learning every Sunday. You're getting gospel truth on a regular basis. And he says to be careful how you build. So now we're talking about building on the foundation. And we're building gospel on gospel with gospel truth. The second ring. The doctrine that we live our lives by. The truth can only be, though, applied because of the gospel. Now here's an example of what I mean. Ephesians 4.32. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God in Christ has forgiven you. I call this just as theology. Just as theology. Just as Christ 
has done for us, so we are able to do the same because of what he has already done. He has made it possible. Kindness, tenderheartedness, traits of a normal Christian. These fruits don't just grow out of nowhere. They grow out of a foundation. The gospel. The forgiveness that we have in Christ is the gospel. But the truth that Paul's talking about here, that we forgive others, grows out of that. And without the gospel at the root of it, you're not going to be able to forgive others. Or you're going to find it next to impossible to forgive others. And in fact, many of you sitting here today probably are struggling with some unforgiveness over somebody in your life. The only way you're ever going to get beyond that is by getting back to just as theology. How do you do that? Just as God in Christ forgave you. What wonderful news. I didn't make a move toward God. I was a sinner. Listen, I was, I was saved. I was raised in the Southern Baptist Church. So I, I was saved at a very young age, six, seven years old. Because they, they did bring the gospel very clearly in the Baptist Church. And I remember growing up thinking, wait a minute, did I really get the gospel? Did I? And the older I got, the more I understood scripture, the more I realized, no, God did that. God drew me, even as this young child, to himself. And I look back now and I see the conviction of sin and I see God delivering me. That wasn't the end of sin in my life. If any of you know a six-year-old, you know that sin's not suddenly gone from their lives. They're, they're pretty profound sinners, and they still do what six-year-olds do. But we're called to forgive, and it only happens because of this foundation of what God has done. We're only able to truly forgive when we realize the great debt we have been forgiven. Here's another one, fruit of the Spirit. Galatians 5, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, and you go on through the list. If we just try to simply live our lives this way, we're going to find it impossible to do. But in Christ, on a foundation, these things not even accessible without the cross, we can now give our lives to. The, the, the very definition of love itself, 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 8, love is patient, love is kind, does not envy or boast, is not arrogant or rude, and on and on. Our ability to love like this is only possible because the greatest display of love known to us happened on the cross. Because we can see that just as Christ did that on the cross, we are able now to love like Jesus. Ephesians 5, 21. Husbands, love your wives. What does it say? Just as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. Guess what, guys? No hope. <laughs> no hope of loving your wife like you need to outside of the gospel foundation, outside of what Jesus has done for us, outside of seeing that he has given his life for us. So we are able now to give our lives. This just as Christ loved the church. We do that for our wife in the same way, humbly, sacrificially, dying to yourself and to your own desires. That's Bible truth. But it grows out of one thing, just as. Just as God in Christ did this for you by giving up your own life, not demanding it. These are unique places where the words, even just as, are actually used. But this goes throughout Scripture. These truths go throughout, and you have to take them with that just as in mind. The next ring, so you've got at the center, you've got the gospel. Then you've got that next ring, gospel truth. Now we go to the third ring, or the next ring out there, gospel practice. So now we're going to put it all into practice. And the same thing is true. The practical outworking of the gospel in our lives is rooted and founded in the gospel itself. They are not the gospel. Gospel practices are not the gospel itself, but they are emanating from the truths that come out of the gospel. And so we must constantly take our practice back to the truth that's at the center. Go back to the foundation. 
of what we are, the righteousness of God in Christ. That's what defines you. Make no provision for the lust of the flesh. Now, Romans 13, 14 says that. Put on or clothe yourself with the Lord Jesus Christ. So this is one of the best illustrations of gospel practice. Putting on the Lord Jesus Christ. And make no provision for the lust of the flesh. Do you see what's happening there? You put on Christ first and then you can make no provision for the lust of the flesh. You go back to the foundation, who you are, how it defines you. And rooted in this fact, you can make no provision for the lust of the flesh. So the things we've talked about, forgiveness, fruit of the spirit, love, husbands, loving your wives, all of those things are rooted in that fact. Colossians 3.10 makes this very, this process very clear. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things on earth. This, he says, where's the gospel in there? Well, he uses the word if, but the if is what's called in Greek a first-class conditional. And what first-class conditional means is it can be easily uh, interpreted since. So, since you have been raised with Christ, set your mind on things above, not on things on earth. But it all starts with that since. And we're able to then put our minds on things above and not on the things on earth. Then later it says in verse 5, put to death the worldly things, sin and then, so this is our practice. Now we can, okay, we can actively go out there and put to death the things in our lives that are not bringing glory to God, that are sinful or just unhelpful in your life. And so that's the practice. That's what we need to be doing daily, constantly. We need to be aware of, of bad attitudes or things that we say or sharp words to our wife or husband or whatever the case may be. All of these things that go on in our lives, we, we bring them. And we're, we're, in essence, we're saying, Lord, I'm going to come and bring this to you, and I'm going to put it off. I'm not going to do this. And so that's, that's the gospel focus, bringing a gospel practice. Ephesians 4.22 does the same thing. Paul says, put off your old self, which, is, which belongs to your former manner of life, and put on the new self, which is being, which is being made in the likeness of God. How do you do that? Only by going back and recognizing the profound nature of the gospel. Verse 21, he goes on and says, assuming, this is where I get that. You go on to verse 21. He says, assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus. Paul's again. See, I want you to notice something. This isn't just a pet peeve of mine. This is something that Paul's doing constantly. He's constantly grabbing you, if I can say it, by the scruff of the neck and bringing you back to the gospel and saying, hey, come on, get back here. Understand who you are in Christ. Understand what he's done for you. You're struggling? You're struggling with putting on Jesus Christ? You're struggling with the lusts of the flesh? That's good. Just come back to the gospel and understand the power of God to make that a reality in your life. Paul is not just assuming the gospel here. He literally spent the first three chapters of Ephesians constantly pounding the gospel. Martin Luther says of, of, of Paul's approach, he said, of the grace of God, you must beat it into their heads. And that's what, Luther's a scary guy. I don't know, you know, it's not the kind of guy I think I would want to just hang out with on a normal basis. That's his concept. You're not to beat the grace of God into their heads. So Jerry Bridges, a good, actually a good friend of Solid Grace, who wrote many books. In one of his books, he talked about preaching the gospel to yourself every day. You need to preach the gospel to yourself every day. Every morning when you get up, preach the gospel to yourself. Martin Lloyd Jones, Martin Lloyd Jones, a, a British theologian, said this. Have you realized that most of your unhappiness in life is due to the fact that you are listening to yourself instead of talking to yourself? <laughs> that, one, that one takes me, 
I still have to con meditate on that to get it. But he's saying, how many of you know what it's like to just sit there and listen to your inner talk? You know, yeah, well, I didn't do so well yesterday, and I'm going to do this, and I should do this, and maybe I'll, and what, what changes can I make? And it's just constantly going on in your head and feeling the condemnation or whatever the case may be. And what he's saying here is quit listening to yourself and start talking to yourself. Start saying to yourself, I am the righteousness of God in Christ. Then right away, you probably feel like, but I don't feel like the righteousness of God in Christ. Well, <laughs> you just started listening again. Go back and talk to yourself. You're talking the truth of Scripture. Uh, there is no condemnation. These are all things that are true of you now as believers in Jesus. And you must talk to yourself. Now the rubber meets the road, and you're going to do what the truth requires or not. Are you going to forgive? Where do you get the power to apply that truth? Only through the gospel. When you fail in the sin, is all you do just try harder next time? Or do you go back and preach the gospel to yourself afresh? That's how it works. Now when you come face to face with grace, you don't begin, you didn't begin, you realize you didn't begin this and you can't complete it. John Newton understood this when he wrote Amazing Grace. Amazing Grace just highlights this beautifully. He says, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. And then we see the practice. It was grace that taught my heart to fear. And fears my and, and, and grace my fears relieve through many dangers, toils, and snares I have already come. Tis grace that brought me safe thus far, and grace will lead me home. He understood this. He was constantly coming back to the foundation. He understood that. If you don't, it will simply degenerate into a moralistic, legalistic set of things you have to do. It's a boat without a key. Jesus spent a great deal of his time teaching the disciples what the kingdom of God should look like. But in the end, he said, I'm going to die. See, you look at Jesus' teaching and you read, let's say you read uh, Matthew 5, 6, and 7. You think, I mean, he makes, he, makes, <laughs> he makes the law worse. He makes it harder. But then he tells his disciples, now this is what's going to happen. How is this going to be a reality in your life? I'm going to be arrested. I'm going to be taken before the tribunal. I'm going to be beaten. I'm going to be mocked. I'm going to be crucified on a cross. And three days later, I'm going to rise again. And the disciples, it was like over their heads. They did not understand that. Five, I don't know, four to six times Jesus does this. And they never get it. Even when he when, when they run to the tomb and they run in and they see the grave clothes and they're just like, I don't get it. What's going on here? But see, it's the cross that makes all Jesus' teaching reality in our lives and only the cross. Final ring. The final ring is gospel culture. Gospel culture. The outworking of our practice as individuals is a gospel culture established in the local church. You talk about a vision, this is your vision. To build a gospel culture rooted in the gospel, founded on the foundation, secure, evident for everyone to see a culture of joy, gratitude, serving, forgiveness, fellowship, defined by the fruit of the Spirit and and love, as we see in 1 Corinthians 13, we become a gospel culture that reflects a group of people putting on Jesus. That's what it is. It's a group of people that are putting on Jesus, and everybody can see that. Does that break down at times? Does sin raise its ugly head in our lives and disrupt our gospel culture? Absolutely. What's our response to be? When, when sin mars our gospel culture or just whatever breaks down our gospel culture what do we do 
become angry, disillusioned, lash out, criticize, gossip, slander our fellow believers, and go on and on, the different responses that can. Or do we go back to the gospel, get centered again, focused on Jesus, restore the gospel practice because of the cross, you can forgive and walk in peace with each other. Now let me say this as I'm closing. If you don't think you can do that, you don't understand the gospel. And maybe you sit there today and you think, yeah, you're right, I don't get that. Then my challenge to you, get back to the gospel. Go back to the very just as theology that underlies everything we do in our lives. Ultimately, this is the culture we want to see in the local church. But it's only possible as we build on this foundation. We need to apply the truth with our focus clearly on the gospel, on the finished work of Christ. This, this, this is my vision for the local church. We talk a lot about vision. You know what the vision for the local church is? The gospel lived out in day-to-day -day life, clear for everyone to see. This is the mission, should you choose to accept it. And it ain't going to dissolve in five seconds. It's not going anywhere. It's up to us to grab that mission, that vision, and say, that's, that's what I'm here to build. That's what I want to build. I want to build that in my life. I want to build that in my family. And I want to build that here in this local church. Let's pray. Father, we are grateful people. We're grateful that we can even talk about a culture like that. A culture where there is forgiveness and joy and servanthood and peace and encouragement and fellowship. All of those things that are there as a result of what you have done in our hearts. Because now we can put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, help us to do this. Help us to honor you with our lives. Help us to honor you in this church. Lord, restore and build in us and in throughout us uh, a testimony and a witness to this community of a gospel culture rooted in Christ Jesus. And we pray this in your name. Amen. Thank you, Ryan. It's not what we want. We want to be a people saturated in the gospel. People who emanate, who whose aroma is the gospel. A church who is filled with people that are enamored with the gospel of Christ. And that be the heartbeat of our culture. And then from that heartbeat, we move out. We move out. Would you please stand? And I would like to invite the music team to join me up front for communion. Our Savior, Jesus Christ, has ordained and instituted the communion table for his church, for his bride. This is an opportunity to be nourished and sustained by the God's ongoing grace. We are united by faith to Christ and his church until he returns and makes all things new. And so we come to the table. In the eating of the bread and the drinking of the cup, we are remembering Christ's sacrificial death in our place for the forgiveness of our sins, yes. recalling our deliverance from judgment and celebrating our reconciliation to God. All who are trusting in Christ and are baptized in the name of the triune God are invited to come and to receive the elements this morning, the bread and the cup, to participate in Christ, the foundation, to remember the truth of the gospel that God has come to us. God has given his life through his son to us. His broken body was given for us. His blood was spilt on our behalf. And so we come and we eat 
and we participate in the life of Christ as his redeemed, as his church, as his bride, as people filled, as people commissioned, as people redeemed by the gospel of Jesus. If you are a Christian, then we ask that you come and receive the bread and the cup. If you are not a Christian or you're not in good standing with the church, we ask that you would remain in your seats and that you would seek the face of the Lord, right? That you would seek reconciliation first with the Lord and then with others, then come and receive. We'll start with this side of the room. The music team is going to lead us in song. We'll start with this side of the room. Please come up, receive the bread and the cup, return to your seat, and then I will come back up for instruction from the Gospels. Music team, would you lead us?
indeed all glory be to Christ. Our instruction this afternoon comes to us from Luke chapter 2, or 22, excuse me. Luke writes, and when the hour came, Jesus reclined at table and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. And he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Grateful for the body of Jesus, broken and marred, that we might be mended and made whole. Let's take and eat together. Luke continues, after dinner, he took the cup, saying, this cup is poured out for you, is the new covenant made in my blood. Grateful for the blood of Jesus poured out that we might receive forgiveness for our trespasses, according to the riches of God's grace in Christ. Let's drink together. The music team is going to lead us in one last song, and then I will come back up to give our benediction.
Amen. Our benediction comes from 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 18. Peter writes, But grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Yes. To him be glory, both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. Amen. Grace and peace, church. Amen.